What's thwarting my Sophies? I'm Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, and during the break we took between this chapter and the last one, I stole back the case of Perrier, and I'm going to throw it at some point. Oh, Sophie's God. standing next to me right now trying to get it back, but she's not. She's not gonna. Everybody's no, nervous. but I need a drink. <laughs> if yeah. I open oh, wow. the Perrier can to get a drink to wet my throat, then when I throw it, it's just gonna do more damage. Wait, so you're going to take one out, and you're going to throw that one. Well, now I'm not. Uh. <laughs> There's something a of, of a vi- truth lot, happening. A visual, but... <laughs> visual things going on yeah. right now. What I love about visual things <laughs> is that they're the ideal thing to do on a podcast. Mm. Famed visual medium. We're doing great. Chapter five, A Hidden Civil War. Mm. Cool. Uh, <laughs> 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 One of the issues with discussing the history of secret organizations formed to overthrow the government is that, for obvious reasons, an awful lot is left in shadow. We do not know the precise day or the hour that the order was founded. We do not know its exact composition or to what precise extent men like Louis Beam and William Pierce were involved in it. Officially, the order was probably formed. Probably not a lot. Yeah. Probably not, no. certainly not a lot. No, no. Officially, the order was founded in September of 1983 by Robert Matthews during a convention he attended for Pierce's National Alliance in Arlington. While Beam and Pierce tended to approach the issue of sparking a fascist revolution rather differently, Matthews had deep ties to both men. He was profoundly influenced by Beam's ideas and writings, and was also an obsessive fan of the Turner Diaries. He essentially acted as a bridge between the two sides of the vanguardist movement, tying Beam's Klansmen and Christian identity nuts together with Pierce's neo-Nazis. William Pierce called the order the Aryan Resistance Movement. Robert Miles called it the Bruderschweigen, or Silent Brotherhood. But to Bob Matthews, and most of the members, it was known simply as the Order. In direct imitation of the group responsible for organizing the fictional white nationalist insurgency in the Turner Diaries. There were originally nine men, three from the National Alliance, four from the Aryan Nations, and one former Klansman. So that's cool. Now, Matthews devised a six-step strategy for his new terror organization. He would start by recruiting a base of soldiers around the nation and train them at sundry fascist compounds around the country. Once Matthews had a trained corps of soldiers, they would begin committing robberies and counterfeiting money. This would fund the purchase of an arsenal, which would allow them to commit more ambitious robberies and raise millions of dollars, which they would then dispense to different fascist groups around the nation. In essence, Bob Matthews had looked out at all the white supremacist compounds around the country, places like Elohim City, the Aryan Nations, Nehemiah Township, and various posse comitatus communities. He decided these groups had potential if they were connected and funded more effectively. The order was a way to do that. In carrying out this plan, Matthews was both working to fulfill Pierce's dream of a big tent fascist organization and actively funding Beam's plan to connect these different groups via the early internet. Okay. Cool? Uh, Just a bunch of cool buds hanging out. Bunch of cool dudes having cool friends. The order's end goal was a white ethno state in the Pacific Northwest. Here, too, Matthews was following in the footsteps of other fascist thinkers. The Northwest Imperative, as it is now known, first propped up in the 1970s and was initially cheered on by Christian identity pastor and Aryan Nations leader Richard Butler. In creating the order, Matthews had synthesized decades of far-right thinking with his love of the Turner Diaries into a serious plan for revolution. On paper, it looked kind of silly. It was even based off of a piece of speculative science fiction. But Matthews quickly turned his plans into action. On October 28, 1983, Bob and several of his men held up an adult bookstore in Spokane, Washington, netting $300. It was an... Seems silly, right? Seems silly. Seems not worth it. Seems not worth it. But this small-scale crime was just the start of many. Matthews and his crew kept on robbing. Two months later, they stole $25,000 from a Seattle bank. Okay. Then $3,600 from a Spokane bank. Yeah, they robbed yeah. a courier after picking up the daily cash receipts from a Shoney's restaurant and made out with $8,000. Oh. The order professionalized quickly, and within a matter of months, they'd also started counterfeiting $50 bills. Okay, they pr- yeah. What? Yeah. They don't need to do that. They're still on the money. They really didn't need to do that. It would turn out to have been a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But the idea was that, like, by counterfeiting money, they could both damage the state by, like, bring on financial collapse mm, yeah. and that they could make money. Yeah. 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 By spring 1984, Robert Matthews had proved himself to be a competent and dangerous guerrilla leader, and his order was quickly becoming the biggest new thing in American fascism. Dozens of young militants flocked to join and do their part to further the cause. They flooded in from other far-right groups with names like the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, Ugh. sundry posse comitatus <laughs> crews, so and assorted bad. KKK <laughs> chapters. Yeah, they're all, they're, they're fucking nerds. It just, it doesn't, it always grosses me out. <laughs> yeah, the Proud Boys are just one variation on a theme of terrible 
names yeah. for right-wing terrorist groups. Yeah. yeah. In order to build camaraderie and loyalty, Matthews developed rituals for his warrior elite. I'm going to quote now from Bring the War Home. They took their induction oath on Matthew's farm. They stood in a circle around a white female infant who symbolized the race they sought to protect. They raised their arms in a Hitler salute. I, as a free Aryan man, they recited, hereby swear an unrelenting oath upon the green graves of our sires, upon the children in the wombs of our wives. They swore that they had no fear of death or foe, but had a sacred duty to do whatever is necessary to deliver our people from the Jew and bring total victory to the Aryan race. They pledged secrecy about all activities to follow. They swore to rescue any of their number taken prisoner. Should an enemy agent hurt you, they promised their silent brothers, I will chase him to the ends of the earth and remove his head from his body. Their oath recognized them as racial warriors, but also transformed them into weapons. My brothers, let us be God's battle axe and weapons of war. Let us go forth by ones and twos, by scores and legions, as true Aryan men, they vowed. We are in a state of war and will not lay down our weapons until we have driven the enemy into the sea and reclaim the land which was promised to our fathers of old, and through our blood and his will becomes the land of our children to be. I cannot believe these nerds you look so disgusted through that entire thing i was just like oh i hate it so much some sexist racist awful white supremacist bullshit it, but it's, it's also it's, so they're so embarrassing it's also, yeah. it's really it's also what it is it's like they're so evil and they're so lame this is part of why i think that like making stuff like dungeons and dragons and larping yeah. more socially acceptable might reduce the number of young uh, men who a do healthier this healthier outlet yeah just give them a, an excuse to talk about axes and yeah, 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 yeah. And pretend they're magical in a token things novel. instead yeah. of like yeah. hating people except gamers you know yeah that really kind of proves me incorrect on that because <laughs> They just did both. <laughs> just do both. They just do both, yeah. In March 1984, the Order carried out their first robbery of an armored car. They netted $43,000. They robbed the same armored car again in April and got their biggest score yet, $230,000. Later that month, Order members also bombed a synagogue in Boise, Idaho. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> As the summer of 1984 rolled along, Matthews and other members of his inner circle began to worry that one of their men, Walter West, might talk. Two of Bob's men shot and buried him in the woods on June 1st. A little more than two weeks later, on June 17th, Matthews and three of his men shot and killed Alan Berg, a Jewish radio host and anti-fascist who regularly attacked neo-Nazis on the air. The Berg murder officially raised the order's profile and guaranteed major law enforcement attention. The group's danger was reinforced a month later when they heisted a Brinks truck in Ukiah, California, and made off with a staggering $3.6 million. Wow. Jeez. So. <laughs> yep. Wonder yeah. where all that money went. <laughs> Let's read the next paragraph. <laughs> now flush with enough cash to rage, wage a revolution, Matthews and his order began buying up guns like they were going out of style. That's where it mm -hmm. went. They also purchased a 300-acre plot of land in Missouri and 110 acres in Idaho. Each participant in the robbery got $40,000, but the bulk of the money went to other fascists around the country. Different organization received grants in $100,000 increments. Matthews also tithed... Yes, here's your, here's yeah. your Nazi grant. Here's your Nazi grant. God. Do Nazi yeah, research. Yeah, 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 good luck with your Nazi stuff. Matthews also tithed 10% of his stolen money to the Aryan nations. So that's good. Mm. So, yeah, you know, just give him, give him mm. out, give they're, him back. They're really hurting for cash. Yeah. yeah. You know who else is hurting for cash? Oof, that's a bad ad transition, Sophie. <laughs> yeah, talk, talking about like Nazi you know, welfare. Here's one. <laughs> you know who else wants your cash? Who and is better than Nazis? Yeah. The advertisers, the advertisers for this show. Advertisers for this show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That we that's hope, you hope. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Boy, I am not doing great today. <laughs> I do have Chekhov's case of oh Perrier. God. No, not yet. I just, I, I feel like I have to really build it up because My it, heart it's stopped. Yeah, definitely yeah. going to be the last thing I get to throw in oh, this room. Man, you're locked in now. <laughs> Sophie's just giving me a look. Anyway, products! <laughs> We're back. How you doing, Sophie? Yeah, you should be, ma uh, make sure the dog's on the other side of the room. Because who knows when I'll throw this Perrier. Just look for the dog. <laughs> throw it. <laughs> I will. All right. Now, members of the Order developed uh, code names and acquired fake IDs. Matthews even had silver medallions crafted to act as proof of membership. Yeah, cool. you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it's about to get cooler, Katie, because they had nicknames. 
What? Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> Nicknames like Lone Wolf, oh, Field that. Marshal, <laughs> Yosemite Field? Sam. Did you say Veal Marshal? Field, Field, Field Marshal. Marshal. Yeah. Oh, these are bad. Yeah, Yosemite Man, Sam. Yosemite all of them. That's like, yeah. ooh. Yeah. One member was nicknamed Mr. Closet for his love of assaulting gay men. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. No. It makes it sound like he's in the closet, yeah. which he probably was. He probably was. Mm. Louis Beam was codenamed Jolly and Lone Star. Pierce was codenamed Brigham after Mormon leader Brigham Young. Both <laughs> men had medallions. The only good nickname there is Jolly. Man, they are showing <laughs> themselves. One, First of all, it's super lame to pick your own nickname, and you know they all picked their own nicknames. Yeah. And Except for maybe Mr. Closet. I feel like somebody gave him that nickname. Right. <laughs> yeah, most yeah, likely. But they're so bad. They're so lame. They're so lame. Okay. And bad. So they're silly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get it all. It's like uh, Lone Wolf. All right, no, you're not. You're like a bunch of nuts. <laughs> yeah, you got your law enforcement field officer. No, field marshal. Field marshal. Field marshal. Right, like, yeah, it's like, like a. So, like, there's yeah. some cops that are Nazis. And, well, no, uh, no, that's not a field marshal. That's not a cop thing. Or like, or like in for- law enforcement. No, no, field marshal's like a, a general level rank, but it was like it, okay. the Germans had a lot of field. Not oh, okay, not yeah, only yeah, yeah. Germans, but, but like military guy. Military, yeah, military, it's a military not, rank. Not, yeah, yeah, but the same like idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you got Yosemite Sam, which is silly. Yep. You got all, you got all the things that they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's silly. I know exactly silly. who they are. Yeah. In nine months, Bob Matthews had turned his dreams and the theories of men like Beam and Pierce into a real revolutionary movement. He'd made the Turner Diaries real. New recruits to the order were reportedly handed copies of the book. And for a while, law enforcement seemed powerless to do anything to stop them. According to Bring the War Home, quote, even if federal agents and a few journalists were aware of the white power movement, the mainstream public continued to see most white power violence as the work of errant madmen. The phrase lone wolf, previously used to describe criminals acting alone, was employed increasingly in the 1980s and 90s to describe white Mm -hmm. power activists. Mm -hmm. This played into the movement's aim to prevent anyone from putting together a cohesive account of the group's actions. Yep. That all checks out, doesn't it? And they're also silly. Mm -hmm. So So why take them seriously? The history of how Mm -hmm. we don't call white terrorists... But you White know terrorists. who we should call terrorists? Antifa. Right, the group yeah, that didn't terrorists. kill anybody. Yeah. Wait, zero people? Yes. Hmm, Are you suggesting <laughs> that they're not? I'm just saying, like, <laughs> of, of the groups I'm willing to consider terrorists, Al-Qaeda, the death toll thousands, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, Antifa, death toll zero. The KKK right, right. death toll thousands, but they're not actually a terrorist group mm. in the U.S. That's that's what's white nationalist terrorism. <sighs> it does doesn't seem to be treated as seriously. Mm. And so that's because they're a bunch of lone wolves in a pack together. Yeah, you can't fight lone wolves. But they're they're yeah. a pack, but they're alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're a lone pack. They're mm-hmm. they're a pack of lone wolves, like, which you can't defend like against. Cells, an oxymoron like is what it is. Like, uh... <laughs> Okay. Good times. Mm. So, uh, the order's undoing came from a member of the group and a former National Alliance goon named Tom Martinez. Matthews had brought Martinez in to help pass counterfeit bills around his home in Philadelphia. He was caught by the FBI, and he turned informant to avoid prison. The FBI used this information to track Matthews to Portland, Oregon, where they engaged him in a short gun battle. Bob was wounded, but managed to flee to Whidbey Island in Washington with several of his most loyal soldiers. The FBI surrounded the house, and eventually all of Matthews' men surrendered. But Robert Matthews refused to give up. Alone, he fought the FBI off for an astonishing 40 hours. The Bureau eventually burned the cabin down around Matthews, killing him on December 8th, 1984. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bit of a hero to these guys to this day. Yeah, I bet he is. Yeah. With their leader dead, the order eventually crumbled, proving, by the way, that Louis Beam had been right to emphasize leaderless resistance. After five months of arrests around the country, more than 50 members of the order had been arrested. The FBI recovered a great deal of cash, but millions remained unaccounted for. They found what some of that money had bought, though, when they raided the heavily armed Ozarks compound of the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. Law anti-tank rockets and machine guns were found hidden on the property. The CSA were not the only group who had bought rocket launchers with the order's ill-gotten gains, however, and not all of those weapons were recovered. This is part of why uh, it became illegal for U.S. servicemen to be members of extremist groups because all these fucking weapons kept getting into yeah, their hands. And that's yeah. the only reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the only reason you did. It used to be really easy to get military-grade weapons. They did some reforms that have made that harder, apparently. So, well, good bully for them. Kudos mm-hmm. the military. I mean, they're actually, of, of all the government organizations, they're the only one with any kind of effective long-term response to any of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's so, true. Yeah. 
Now, the first trial associated with the order took place in Seattle and included several members of the CSA. They pled guilty on weapons charges and were convicted of racketeering. Next, the U.S. attorney brought a 93-page indictment against 23 members of the order. Robert Miles, Louis Beam, and William Pierce were not indicted. In the months leading up to the trial, members of the order rolled over on their comrades with unusual regularity. By the time the trial rolled around in September 1985, only 10 of them actually faced trial. This hardened core of loyal racists included David Lane, the man who would years later coin the 14 words that neo-Nazis still use today as a calling card. Right on. Yep. During the case, prosecutors specifically noted that the Turner Diaries had acted as a blueprint for Bob Matthews. According to Blood and Politics, quote, in an opening statement, a defense attorney acknowledged that his client was a Klan member and an avowed white supremacist, or white separatist. Now I say white separatist, he continued, because there is a significant difference in an individual who professes to be a white supremacist as opposed to a white oh, separatist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. What was that difference? The white separatist is nothing different than a black nationalist who advocates a separation of races, wants to live only with those members of his race. He advocates the fact that when races are mixed together, they cannot survive because of their division and their cultural background their upbringing, and their history. The Seattle jury did not buy this distinction between white supremacy and white separatism in 1985 any more than the Supreme Court was willing to ignore separate but equal doctrine in 1954. Neither did the jury believe defense efforts to impugn the credibility of Aryans who became prosecution witnesses, nor did jurors accept contentions that the defendant's beliefs were unrelated to the enumerated crimes. After four months at trial, all were found guilty. Okay. So that's good. That's That's good. good. Yeah. 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 Now, in death, Bob Matthews and his order became a symbol for fascists around the country. In Raleigh, North Carolina, hundreds of Nazis rallied under banners that said, We love the order. In Idaho, a group called Order 2 set off several bombs in Coeur d'Alene. The date of Matthews' death, December 8th, became Martyr's Day to many neo-Nazis. Some of them started carrying out memorial camping trips near where he had been killed on Whidbey Island. But still, the order had failed in its goals and that failure had come at a substantial cost. William Beam and Lewis Pierce had not been indicted or charged as a result of Matthews' activities, but they now found themselves at the center of much more FBI attention. In an operation named Clean Sweep, the Bureau began seeding white supremacist organizations around the country with undercover operatives. Later in 1985, they stopped an Aryan nation's plot to kill a government informant. Another terrorist associated with the group was stopped after a bombing a federal building, several businesses, and a rectory in Coeur d'Alene. In 1986, the feds busted William Potter Gale, founder of the Posse Comitatus in Nevada. Gale and several allies were convicted of planning to bomb the IRS. Kind of sounds like uh, an insurgency. Yeah, it kind of does sound like an insurgency. A lot of plans. Yep. Near the end of 1986, the FBI busted eight members of a new group, the Arizona Patriots, before they could carry out their goal of following in Bob Matthews' footsteps. The group had planned to rob banks to finance a domestic insurgency. All around the U.S., white supremacists continued to plot and launch attacks. One of these men was Glenn Miller, formerly the leader of a group called the White Patriot Party. He'd received at least $75,000 in order money from Bob Matthews. As the FBI busted more and more of these guys, they found more and more evidence of the order's influence and money. And gradually, they pieced together the story of what had really happened and came to realize that Matthews' group had sought nothing less than the complete overthrow of the federal government. In mid-1986, Louis Beam, Richard Butler, Robert Miles, and several other ideological leaders of the fascist movement were finally indicted for their role in the order. So that's cool. Wow. That's good. Yeah. And uh, we're going to hear about what happened next after. Oh, no. Ads. <laughs> I'm just incapable of doing a good ad transition. That was great. Thank you. But it's a lie. You know, no, it's not oh, a God. lie. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not going to throw it yet. I'm just, I'm building tension. Every time you bring it up. <laughs> this is how you, the screenwriting 101, yeah. Katie. It's I know. It's Chekhov's case of Perrier. I just, my heart stops. That's the idea. But mm-hmm. I'm cool yeah. and laid back. Mm-hmm. So whatever you're going to do. You know, the reality of the situation is, as soon as I started really getting a sense for the heft of this case, <laughs> I started regretting the fact mm-hmm. that I've talked that this up so much. Yeah. But now but it has to happen. What about taking one yeah. out? No. Throwing it. That actually might make it more dangerous. You're, because then it'll yeah, fall out the back yeah. like a scatter bomb. If you open yeah. it, it's more what likely that it'll burst. It. It'll probably still burst. What if we taped pillows all around it? <laughs> I don't think we can do that. I think I have to throw it. You could subvert the narrative and not throw it. But the best thing to do with narratives is not to subvert them. I Sure. You mm-hmm. could just there give it a gentle... We tell stories the way we do. But uh... You could give it a ge- you could redefine what to- throwing is, make it like a, a gentle toss, I an mean, underhand I, toss. I'm not going to go... 110%, because I don't feel like that's necessary given the extremity of what this case of Perrier represents. But I am going to throw it. I mean, those are the, the cans, correct? Yeah. Okay, that's something. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> several pounds. Ten slim cans. 
mm-hmm. as the package states. Mm-hmm. How are we doing, Sophie? Ads. It's not even 12. Products! We're back! What? Oh, okay. <laughs> I did, we hadn't come back yet. <clears throat> I started talking about Perrier. So, uh, yeah, uh, Robert Miles, Richard Butler, Louis Beam, and several other fascist uh, ideologues had gotten indicted for their role in the order. Um, getting all of these guys together was quite a task, and at one point, Louis Beam's wife shot a federal agent who came for them, but uh, eventually they all got wound that. up. Yeah. They all wound up under trial. Um, so, uh, the Justice Department charged these men with a number of crimes, including seditious conspiracy to, quote, overthrow, put down, and destroy by force the U- government of the United States and form a new Aryan nation. Oddly enough, William Pierce was not indicted. Huh. Seditious conspiracy was a crime numerous communists and Puerto Rican nationalists had already been successfully convicted of committing, but no Nazis or white supremacists had ever been convicted of the crime. Despite the order's shocking violence and well-documented goals, this fact did not change. The trial convened in February of 1988, and the fascist defense attorneys managed to exclude any black people from the jury. The trial was almost instantly a shit show, and served more to allow Louis Beam to preach his views to the nation than to guarantee justice. In his opening statement, he told the jury, The only reason I'm here is because I said what I think. If the Constitution is still alive, I'm innocent. Mm. Beam admitted that he had set up computer bulletin boards for different fascist groups around the country, but denied that these boards were used for any illicit communication. He told the jury he'd been changing his daughter's diaper when the purported meeting that created the order had occurred. So he dubbed the government's case the baby diaper conspiracy. Wait a minute. Oh. For the whole meeting? Yeah, that's what that's he said. an outrageous diaper. Like, take her to the doctor, man. <laughs> doesn't hold up. You're doing more to pick the story apart than anyone in the court of law did. Beam ended one speech in his defense with an almost word-for-word recitation of something he'd written in essays of a Klansman about his anger at protesters he'd supposedly encountered after returning home from Vietnam. Quote from Beam. As I sat there watching the flag disintegrate, rage and bitterness began to engulf me. The flames consuming the flag changed to flames enveloping an armored personnel carrier in the Hobo Woods north of Saigon. The cheers of the demonstrators became the screams of a 19-year-old soldier over his radio as he burned to death, trapped inside what was fast becoming his coffin. The clapping of hands as the flag fell to the ground became the deafening roar of my M60 machine gun as I literally melted the barrel in an attempt to pin down the enemy long enough for the dying soldier's friends to reach him. Finally, at last, came the laughter of those demonstrators as they spit on the ashes at their feet, blending in my mind with the sobs of grown men as I remembered the armored personnel carrier disappearing in a ball of orange flame. Okay. The the, the prosecution just lets them say this shit. It's, yeah. 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 The judge just lets them say this shit. It's, yeah, yeah. Upsetting. After seven weeks of trial, Louis Beam and his fellow defendants were all found not guilty of seditious conspiracy. Sure. They were released, presumably free to return to their lives in the movement. Of doing nothing, though. Like, of doing nothing. Go back their, their lives. Harmless lives of being harmless. The Justice Department had taken its shot at the intellectual center of the white supremacist movement. They had failed. And ultimately, their failure came not from law enforcement's unwillingness to prosecute Nazis, but from ordinary white Americans and the sympathy they held for men like Beam who build themselves as warriors against communism and patriots. Beam's racism and his desire to overthrow the government simply weren't seen as that bad by a jury of his peers. Sure. Mm -hmm. The leaders of the white supremacist movement had gotten off more or less scot-free, but the court battle and the months many of them had spent on the lam before being arrested had aged them all. Richard Butler's influence would gradually fade after he returned home to Idaho. Louis Beam continued to be an influential mind within the movement, but he would be more careful and much quieter from now on. The heat brought on by the crackdown forced Beam to retire his beloved inter-clan newsletter and survival alert. The last issue contained an essay by an unknown author, probably Beam. In it, he wrote... The second American revolution will be a revolution of individuals, a revolution without exact precedent in recorded history, because individuals can accomplish complex acts of resistance without peril of betrayal or even detection by the most advanced snooping devices. Missions formerly assigned to groups may be undertaken by individuals equipped to fight alone. Mm -hmm. It would not be long before a young man named Timothy McVeigh would prove these words prophetic. Individualistic. Yeah. Yeah. It's collective, but they're lone, they're lone wolves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah lone that's wolves. the thing. Mm. But they are lone wolves. Just individual crazy people, mm-hmm. like the guy who shot up the Gilroy Garlic Festival. 
right? Mm-hmm. Not connected to a larger movement. What was the um, manifesto or the book that he's been reading? It was by, by a guy named Ragnar Redbeard, and it's one of a number of books that appears like regularly in full. Yeah, he was, he was like writing in the 1890s um, about like white nationalism and uh, kind of eco fascism, like kind of a really mm. early eco fascist text. Yeah, it's what uh, um, the other fucking guy, that piece of dumb piece of shit, said. Yeah. In his. And it's one of a number of books that circulates a lot on 8chan, actually. Um, like they yeah. send around PDFs for this stuff. Like it's stuff that people wouldn't have been able to get before the internet, which is why Louis Beam was 100% right to start doing this. Yeah, uh, We'll talk absolutely. more about that later. I think I'm going to wait until yeah. next episode to really <laughs> launch this Perrier, but that's what we call uh, foreshadowing. Or stating your intentions, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. Kind of like the so- Nazis did. And like mm. the Nazis, I expect to not get in trouble no matter what happens. Yeah. I would say Maybe. that that's actually foreshadowing that you won't throw the Perrier. Like you're talking yourself up about it. You're bringing it up. You're reinforcing it in a bl- uh, really obvious way. No, no. And so that might be foreshadowing to us that you're not. Yeah. You're going to change your mind. Oh, I've got to I've got to throw him. Until but I said this. You keep saying it. that. Yeah. Well, Anywho. But then he said that. We've talked about it too much. Well, you guys want to plug your pluggables? Yeah, you know what? We do. We have a show called Some More News. That's the YouTube show. And a podcast called Even More News. Mm-hmm. Cody? Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> and a Patreon. Patreon. And a Twitter. And dot com. Oh. And a tea Public. And a tea Public. And we're on Twitter. Yeah. You can buy t-shirts from tea Public. Uh, you can find us on the internet somewhere. Yeah, you can. I'm going to throw these cans in the next episode. Oh, oh no. Yeah. I scooted all the way away. I know. I, lo- I love making you flinch. <sighs> Just listen to the sound. That's that's foreshadowing. Can that's I have one? ominous. No. <laughs> Under no circumstances. All right. Episode over. <laughs>